Well, we looked at Asher, we looked at the seeming insignificant ones, how God has a plan. And I think the only thing to get us out of sometimes, especially in our culture, the doldrums of you know, who am I? What am I? What's my purpose? What am I even here for? What am, am I going to really make a difference? Is God's time is not our time. And we, we need to kind of get a different mentality when it comes to that. And so turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I just want to touch one thing here. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I, I thought about how that applies. And I realized that in many ways, when you think about hope and it being deferred, that would make you sick. Like you're hoping for something that keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed. That's hard. That's very hard to uh, deal with. It's hard to keep perspective. We get discouraged. Discouragement, by the way, is probably the enemy's number one weapon. I remember hearing an illustration one time where the demons, uh, or the devil was having a, a garage sale and he was selling all of his weapons that he attacks us with. He was putting them on sale. And uh, one weapon he's, he would never let go. He says, well, this, this is not for sale. I'll never let this one go. And it was discouragement. Because from discouragement, you have no idea decisions that you will make. The opposite of that would be there is hope. But you see, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Now, here's the challenge. You got to be willing to be sick. You got to be willing to be tired. You got to be willing to be sick and tired from time to time. We live in a culture where we've got push button everything, instant gratification. We can get a dopamine fix from video, from this, from that, from pornography, we can get a dopamine fix. We can feel good about ourselves any time of the day. But that only makes the answer delayed even further. And the next time you spiral back, it's even going to be deeper. So we've got to be willing to be sick. Look at Job, for example. Here's a guy who, I mean, he had no answer. And the pain, everything he was going through. But his line, I'll never, it'll be part of my life. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Have you, are you ready for that kind of commitment? Do you, are you confident that much in your God that even if you were going to be slain, okay, well, that's all right. I'm, here I am. Like that missionary to India who, when he got to this little village, and they threatened him and said, if you come here and you stay here, we're going to kill you. And he goes, well, that's okay, because I came to die. And he'd already made his mind up. And how do you stop a person like that? When they're ready to die. I will die before I give in and yield to my baser nature. Now, we don't usually in fighting a battle just give in. We get distracted and then we're not thinking. Then afterwards, we're like, oh, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. It's, we really kind of just, we fall asleep at the, at the wheel. That's our real problem. Because if you knew that this, your life depended on it, this is important, stay awake, do this, you're going to do your duty. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the operative word that I think is missing so much. And we actually had a conversation at our uh, lunch table about that. And I was honored to be sitting with one of the greatest generation. And, you know, they understood one word that we don't in our generation. It's duty. Do your duty. Do what's expected of you to do as a, as a worker, as a friend, as a husband, as, you know, a minister, do your duty. Do what you're supposed to do. We have gotten away from that and to our ruin because they understood what it all came down to. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of this hope deferred and, you know, making the heart sick and being willing to be sick like Job and got a great encouragement on the 12-year-old Amanda because uh, brother um, Brian, Brian, right? Brian Rock? Where are you? Thank you. You know, he came up and shared that his uh, daughter had RSD. That's what it was. Uh, I didn't know the name of it. And, um, and it was a long, long, arduous journey uh, for her to overcome that. And, but now, you know, 29, she's, you know, she's doing well. She's in the medical field. And, you know, fancy that. You know, all that she experienced probably gave her a passion for that. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's just finding, finding our lane. And, and here's a... The big challenge for men is to find their lane, to find what it is that God has called me to do. But you know, even a greater challenge, guys, is stay in your lane. You know, many men who 
get the place where the Lord wants them, they, it's like they're longing for more. They're looking over there. They're trying something else. And I see this especially among ministers. My, in, in this generation, they, they're not content to stay in their lane. They, they want a marketer and a PR, and they're going to get their Facebook page out there, and they're going to get somebody to really craft their message and cleverly do this and that and get the books going and get this going and maybe TV. And, you know, for me, I, I've really prayed through, I want to use what the Lord has given to us. He has opened up an effective door for us with our radio station. I'm going to stay in that lane unless the Lord tells me differently. Uh, he's opened up an effective, you know, uh, school and uh, we're going to stay in that lane. You know, the, the temptation to always get bigger and bigger and bigger, it's, it's a danger. You know, it's a danger. There's nothing wrong with having a, a holy ambition to reach more people. But if you get outside of the lane God has called you in, if you don't know what your lane is and you get outside of it, you're setting yourself up for a lot of discouragement and a lot of emptiness in the end. So find your lane and travel in your lane. You know, one of the interesting things is when the Bible talks about the Word of God, he says, you know, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce the division between, you know, soul and spirit. And I thought, what does that mean? And I thought, this is an interesting thought. By the word of God, I can discern whether that's just from me or whether that's of the Lord. And so if you're familiar with the word of God, it's kind of like just getting familiar with, you know, your spouse if you've been married for, for 30, 40 years. You know, it, it's like the younger, the younger generation just getting started in the Lord, and we were all this way. We, the Lord had to kind of knock upside the head pretty hard before he got our attention, before we realized, oh, okay, maybe you don't want me to do this. Uh, okay, maybe you're closing that door. And kind of like, uh, well, a horse and a mule. That you can't really do anything with them until you put something painful in their mouth to pull them back. And that's in a way how a lot of us started. You know, the Lord had to painfully, okay, okay, Lord, I got the message here. Okay, all right, all right, I won't do that anymore. But Psalm 32 basically tells us, ultimately the, door, the Lord doesn't want you to be like the horse and the mule that need bit and bridle, lest you can't come near them. But the Lord will guide you with his eye. You ever thought of that? You know, to be so familiar with somebody that when something happens, you look at each other and you know exactly what you're thinking. That's how familiar the Lord wants you to be with him. Where something happens, you immediately know. You immediately, right there, you know this is what the Lord thinks about that. This is what he's thinking. I know my Lord because you're familiar with his word and you'll also be able to recognize, you know, that's just me. You know, the Lord is not in this. I have to keep telling myself it's okay, it's okay, it's not okay. So this idea of understanding his will is huge. But this ties into something else. Again, coming back to this idea of, you know, we, we look at men on hope. Men on hope, Wonderful. But then there's also men on drugs. And I'm not just talking about drugs. I'm talking about the three biggies. You know, the, the three things that Solomon was told don't do, he did, and it became his undoing. Multiplied horses, his ego, pride. Multiplied women, you know, sex. And he multiplied gold, money. Power, money, women. By the way, do you know any, anybody in law enforcement here, detectives or anything like that? When a detective is trying to isolate and decide whether a person is a suspect and it's a capital crime, did you know that if they can't find one of those three motives, they stop considering that person a suspect? If it's not sex, if it's not money, and it's not some ego power thing, yeah, he didn't do it. Those three are behind all of the big problems. By the way, those three are the very thing, thing, things that we will constantly battle with as men, and we have to put in their place. There are those difficulties we have to be challenged with about our lives. But you see, when you have hope, what God will satisfy. As a young single man, I remember, you know, sitting there, you know, in church, and when the pastor would say, turn around and meet somebody new, I'd be like, I'd make sure I positioned myself behind the most beautiful girl that I wanted to meet. Hey, how you doing? Oh, fancy meeting you here. You know, yeah, I was setting it up. And the Lord convicted me on this one basis. He said, why do you think it's about you? Maybe you're not right for her. 
who are you? And at that point, the Lord kind of opened my eyes when that whole idea of wanting to get married and meet somebody and get, get, get married. And, and of course, this is what men do. You know, you, especially as godly men, you, you channel that sexual energy toward productivity where you've got to become likable, marriageable, uh, employable, and then you might get a wife. And all that sexual energy is driving you to get that so you can get married and have sex. Now, you see the problem with this plan already that God has in store. We have found many different ways to bypass that and just jump right to the pleasure of sex without having to go through all of that process. We can get what we want immediately with pornography. We can gratify our need. We can get that dopamine fix, and we don't need to do anything. Here's the problem with that plan. God intended... Those pleasures, that open door, he, he intended the, the, the difficulty to get there so that you would have a strong foundation. All that sexual energy he's given you is so that you can become a better person by controlling that beast. If you don't control the beast, it will destroy you. And I'm sad to say that our generation are dissipating all of their their the strength and their wisdom. And we are basically becoming uh, a nation of wimps, uh, demasculized. We, we have no more strength to control our desires. And we don't really need women anymore. I remember reading a biography of this famous uh, rock star who said, you know, I had all this power and position. I could get any woman I wanted, but after a while it just became too much, you know, talk here, and, you know, meet her here and come up here. It was just too much work. It's a, it's, I don't even care about that anymore. I just go and pornography takes care of me. I'm fine. I don't need to work at anything anymore. I can just get my pleasure. That was his conclusion. And he would be right if he didn't see sex as a channel. God gave you that sex to drive for a purpose. He gave you that desire to accomplish something and conquer something for a purpose. So what do you do with that desire? Well... You've got the top score on the video game, and you've accomplished something. And when you reach that top score, and nobody's reached that top score, and you've got the bragging rights, you conquered, you have another dopamine fix. I won. Now, that can come in even little things. You know, people playing video games all the time or playing their phone games and, and getting, oh, I got the best score. Oh, good. I got, oh, I won. I won. You feel good. Here's the problem. Guys, listen very carefully to me. If you can find a way to feel good about yourself with accomplishing nothing, you are in deep trouble. If you can find a way to accomplish pleasure and satisfaction without doing anything significant, you are in deep trouble. God gave you that dopamine fix for once you accomplished something. When you worked hard, you won a wife, and now you, have, you get lucky at night if you treat her well because, you know, you can also get married and not treat your wife well, and, and you learn very quickly it doesn't work that way. She's like, you're not coming near to me tonight, not the way you talked to me in the kitchen this morning. What? What? Now you have to learn, oh, I've got to talk kindly to this woman <laughs> if I'm going to get lucky. I've got to be pleasant. I've got to be nice. I've got to be thoughtful and courteous. Sex begins in the kitchen in the morning, you know, with the way you talk to her and treat her. I remember one particular incident where I was in a particularly ornery mood in the morning, and I just, you know, everything was just not working right, and like, ah, I, was, I, was, I was whining and uh, complaining the way she made the eggs, and, you know, and she's just being quiet over there, ignoring me, and I'm just, I'm, I'm up in the ante a little bit more, and I finally said some real choice, sarcastic thing that I was quite proud of, actually. And I glanced out of my eyes if I get a reaction out of her for that one. And just in time to dodge the peach that she winged at me full speed, <laughs> splattered against the baking rack. And I looked at her and I'm like, oh my. But you see, I, I, I was a little bit wise in those days. I learned a little bit. I was been married for a few years by then. And I realized quickly I did that. So 
I went over to her and I said, you know, honey, I am so sorry. And I, my, my thing with her is like, you know, I'll put my arm around her. And when she's mad at me, she's stiff as a rock. And then I'll just whisper a prayer in your ear, Lord. And it has to be a wise prayer. It has to be a prayer of honesty. Lord, thank you that this woman has put up with this 100% USDA prime beef jerky for so long. And <laughs> I don't deserve her. And I'm just thankful. And as I'm praying, you know, she's getting softer and softer. And I'm so thankful for her. And I, I Lord, forgive me for treating this pre- treasure like this. And, and then after that prayer, you know, she's softened a little bit. And I go clean up the mess. But, but again, this is a part of learning. I mean, you know, every, everybody, we, we don't fight. We just call it intense fellowship, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so here's, here's the wild thing. This all leads into probably one of the biggest tests that I think we could undergo in our own lives. This is kind of like I'm giving you a pop quiz here. Uh, in verse 18 through 21, of Ephesians 5, you see this picture of being filled with the Spirit. And don't be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. In other words, you found another way to get that dopamine fix. But be filled with the Spirit. See, the Lord wants you to have a sense of satisfaction by doing the right thing. And how do you get filled with the Spirit? Well, you ask because you want to be, and you you, you want to please Him, So you're seeking to obey, and Lord, fill me. I can't determine how much he's going to fill me and where and how, but I can be yielded. I can be ready at any given time when he wants to use me. The problem is we're not ready when the time comes, when that person he's put right in your path to talk to, and you haven't really been aware, you know, of his purposes. You're distracted with your own worries. You know, every time I have to go to Walmart for something, I... I have to remind myself when I'm entering into this, I'm entering into an opportunity. And if it's just about me getting to this thing and getting through some of these clunky people that don't know what they're doing anyway, to get to my thing and get in the line and I'm going to choose the fastest line and my thinking is all askewed. I am thinking of my efficiency, but I'm missing an opportunity. So wherever I go now, I, I try to think, how can I turn this into something that the Lord might use me. And I want to be sensitive to that because he might just empower me or give me wisdom or words. I don't know. He's not going to waste all that power if I'm disengaged. So I'll go to Walmart, get my thing, and I get out. And then afterwards, I'm like, oh, Lord, I totally missed it. I didn't even see a single person in there. I was so focused on getting this dumb thing, and I'm in a hurry. I didn't see people. Lord led me one time going into Walmart around Christmas time, which is a sort of purgatory. Um, they hire anybody and anything that can breathe, uh, and you, you have a hardest time getting anything done. But try this next time that happens. Go in there and ask somebody to help you, even though they will not be able to help you. Ask them for their help. And when they try and they try and they try, thank them profusely or putting their heart into it. Thank them so kindly. Be kind to them and what well, get to know their name and thank you so much, John. You know, I appreciate all you tried to help me. And, and uh, when you leave, I can tell you they have never encountered anybody in their entire life like that. They will remember you the next time you come in. You've built a bridge. And who can tell what God will do with that? You know, those are the types of things I see Jesus doing all the time and I go, why don't we do this? But... Here these things are, this is the key. It's the easiest thing in the world to get filled with the Spirit. It really is. Ask. The hard part is, I know when I'm filled with the Spirit, but I don't always know when I'm not. I'll say that again because it's kind of a tough one. You know, I know when I'm filled with the Spirit, but I don't always know when I'm not. So how can I tell whether or not at any given time I'm going to be flowing with his plan? Because if his plan is un- wants to unfold, and he, he will when I'm, I'm yielded to it, you know, there is, therein lies my complete satisfaction of why I can endure an inefficient Walmart worker or why can I endure a long line? Why can I endure, how can I endure this trial or this difficulty or got the flat tire or whatever? Because there is a purpose in it And that gives us that hope which generates faith and love. So all of this comes back to this. Now, deferred hope. 
Have you guys ever heard of that experiment that they did uh, on preschool kids, Stanford University in the 60s with a marshmallow on the desk? Anybody ever hear that one? You know what I'm talking about then. That to me is one of those powerful illustrations because when they did that, of course, they discovered that there was, um, you know, they had some students, they, what they did was, for those of you who don't know, they put a marshmallow on the desk in a preschool, they secretly videotaped these kids, and they said, okay, we're going to leave for 20 minutes. Uh, they didn't say that. We're going to leave for a little bit. We're going to be right back. Don't eat your marshmallow. If you do, no penalty, but you just won't get another one. If you wait, we'll give you another one when we come in. So that's a big test. And they left for 20 minutes, which is an eternity for a preschooler. And they're looking at that marshmallow. Now, some kids, as soon as the teacher left the room, they just, immediate gratification, ate that marshmallow. I want it now. I want that now. I don't care about two marshmallows. I want that one now. Other kids, perfectly patient to wait, didn't have a problem thinking, well, I'll get two. Why would I not wait? And then there were everything in between. All the, some kids were trying to muster self-control and not look at it and try to distract themselves. Some people were actually pulling their hair, you know, trying to like not, you know, muster the self-control to keep from eating that marshmallow. Well, the purpose of that illustration or that um, experiment was not just to see the difference in kids, but they followed these children later on by the time they graduated from high school. And they discovered that the kids who immediately ate the marshmallow had the worst record. They had the worst grades. They had the worst social adjustment. They had, uh, their friends were not good choices for them. They, some of them were dropped out. Some of them, you know, it was the worst of the worst. The ones who waited patiently, they had the best grades. They had the most amazing, you know, friends. They had all the accolades. They had the future bright hope. And then there was everything in between. The whole point of that was they deferred gratification. They deferred gratification. Listen, this is your life as a man. You defer gratification until it's time. Listen, I can, I can go home and I can tell my wife, I'm in the mood, let's have relations together. And I can talk her into it, even if she's not in the mood. She is an amazing woman. But it's not as satisfying. When I get my fill, but, you know, I haven't really done much for her. I haven't really thought of building up to it. And, you know, I, I remember one particular time she used to go, love going on walks. I hate walking, you know. Now I love walking. But at that time, unless I had a basketball in my hand and I was bouncing it, walking was like, what's the point? So I remember one time I was pretty proud of myself. I went out walking with her until she said, did you have to bring the basketball? <laughs> and... Uh, so one time she says, I'm going out walking. She stopped asking me if I wanted to walk anymore because I'm like, the answer was no. And uh, then something came to me. I had this moment of inspiration. I don't know where she is in the neighborhood, but I'm going to go find her. And so I got on my bike. And I'm riding through all the streets, and I finally found her. Her eyes lit up like I was Prince Charming. And, man, it was like skyrockets that night, you know? And I'm just saying... I ministered to her, and that, and that deferring of my desire for her was the beginning of just a brand new way of looking at relations with my wife. That's just one illustration. There's so many other things, but that marshmallow illustration, it's huge. Can you wait? Or are you going to scarf it up right now? Can you wait, or do you want your needs met right now? Do you want to get your way right now? Do you want to have the answer to the prayer right now? Are you frustrated with God because he's not answering you right now? This is all a part of our development as men in the boot camp of life. So we need to learn these things. Now, when you have this hope uh, <laughs> that is so amazing, it's, you don't know what that means. What, what does hope mean? How powerful is hope? Take a person, take hope away, and they despair and die. You can't live without hope. All of us have some measure of hope. But is your hope an anchor? Is it a solid hope, or is it just a vain hope, or a wishful hope, wishful thinking? There was another experiment in the 50s, a gruesome experiment on rats. 
that they performed. Anybody hear this before? This, this is an amazing study. Um, you can Google this and read all about it, but um, I forget the guy's name. might have been Cook, but anyway, the, the scientists that did this, of course, they would have disbarred him now, but uh, he took these rats and he put them in this water container. Rats are good swimmers, but putting them in this container of water and kind of spraying water down on top of them and it was constantly in motion and there was no way to get out. Uh, they discovered after about 17 minutes, on average, these rats would just give up, saw no hope, and die. So just before the rat was ready to go down for the last time, the new change to the experiment occurred where he reached down and grabbed some rats, not all of them. Some of the rats were taken out for a few minutes and then put back in the container. The second time they were put back in the container, they died not at 17 minutes, not at 17 hours. They lasted a full three full days before they finally, out of sheer exhaustion, couldn't go anymore and died. What was even interesting is some of the rats who weren't rescued but saw the other rats being rescued if they, they, they kept some set isolated, they set, kept some that they could see other rats being rescued, then they rescued the one rats. The ones that saw the other rats rescued, all of a sudden, they amped up and they lasted a few days. Hope, and, and the only difference they could tell was one group of rats had hope. It saw somebody being rescued or it was itself rescued and it was hoping again it would be rescued. Now, that's a big difference, folks, between 17 minutes and three full days. What does that tell you? It tells you the power of hope. It tells you that when you have a complete confidence the Lord will be faithful to you because he is God and he cannot not keep his word, you honor him and he will honor you. Listen, if we get that in our hearts, you take care of God's business, he'll take care of yours. You honor him, he'll honor you. When you know that and you're confident of that, no matter, you can endure a m crazy thing. Now, you might think, well, gee, maybe I don't want to learn hope because I don't want to have to endure crazy things. You missed the point. You're going to endure crazy things nonetheless, but many of you are going to give up. Many of you will not be walking with the Lord down the road. I don't say many here. I'm just saying many men won't be walking with the Lord who one time were. You know some that said, yeah, I'm done. I, I prayed and I trusted God and, you know, I prayed for my marriage and my wife locked out of me. I, I asked God. He didn't answer. I'm done. That's the, that's the norm, guys. Yeah, I prayed for that job and that other goofball, you know, he got it. Or I prayed for that promotion and I've worked so much harder than this guy and they, they, they look past me. I'm done with this, Christianity. See, this is the real challenge. We need to be invigorated and empowered and directed that if we're going to be men, and you know the difference between a man and a boy, right? What's the difference between a man and a boy? A boy, you have to discipline. A man disciplines himself. Now think about how many men are not very disciplined. And they're still playing video games at 32 in their parents' basement. They are not growing up. Women are taking over the universities, getting more degrees than men than ever. And that's going to have great repercussions on our nation because it's not going to be good for women in the end. Because in the end, women who typically don't marry someone lower than their educational ability, they only marry equal or above, there's going to be a lot of men who, after playing video games in their basement of their parents' house for so long, are not going to be marriageable. They're not going to be employable. And uh, they're going to follow into this thing where mom... More and more is control of the home. She's going she's gonna to be quite content that she's got her little boy here still with her. And there's a trade-off. See, there's a trade. See, everything's a trade. You know, think about that. Everything's a trade. You trade gratification now for better gratification later. It's a trade. You teach a child to share their toys now. And I had to have this talk with my little four-year-old grandson who is a foster uh, grandson and he had a lot of a lot of drugs in his parental past and he's a little special needs kid and very impulse control is a tough one for him 
So if someone grabs his toy, it's like all hell breaks loose. And he'll jump all over it. And one of the little boys came over and he wanted to play in his little riding car and he wouldn't let him. And, he, and, and I, said, uh, I said, hey, come over here. I want to talk to you. I said, you know, one day you're going to be at his house. And if you share your toy with him now, he'll share with your toy later. That's how to not gratify yourself now, to delay that gratification, and you'll have better later down, down the road. Then if you do that to every friend, you'll have many friends. They'll invite you to their houses because you're, you share and they like you. If you don't share, they won't like you. They won't invite you to their parties. They won't invite you. And you know there's a lot of young men who are poorly socialized simply because their parents just kind of like let them be whatever they wanted, don't want to guide them, don't want to say no, you know, tried to, you know, use time out and didn't work and they didn't go to the next level. My whole point is men need to know this about hope. That's how powerful it is. Well, that's the difference between boys and men. Boys need discipline. Men do it themselves. And, you're never, and there are a lot of men that have, not really men, they haven't gotten out of this boyhood phase. They've not disciplined themselves. All right. Let's come back to this source of power, the Holy Spirit, and the big challenge that we all have. I know when I'm filled, but I don't know when I'm not. How could you, with a surefire way, determine at any given time whether you are filled or not with the Spirit? Or at least whether you are yielded and available if so be that he desires to lift you up and use you in some way and put you back down, but you're a vessel well, willing. Well, he gives three little tests here, in verse 19, 20, and 21, that I find very fascinating. And um, this first test, verse 19 it's all about your words. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. One of the first things the Holy Spirit does when he gets a hold of your life, because he's not an id and a power that you manage. You know, if you're, you guys are well taught here. I mean, you know, Pastor John's got that covered. You, you guys are well taught. So you know the Spirit of God is not an id. It's not a force. It's not about how much of the Holy Spirit you have. It's how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? How much are you yielding yourself to him? Well, here's a way to tell whether or not you are. What is coming out of your mouth? I remember on the way to speak on this very uh, subject at a conference, and I got behind this l person that probably got her driver's license at McDonald's. It was bad. It was riding in the left lane slow, don't do that. Drive left, drive right past left. Okay, we got that? I'm, I'm the quintessential backseat driver. But anyway, I get behind this lady. I'm like, oh, lady, come on. And I'm talking in front of her. Like, oh, come on, lady, get over. You know, and I'm trying to get up close, flash by lights and everything. You know, no message. You know, lights are on, nobody's home. So finally, I just go around and I'm like, as soon as I got almost equal to her, the Holy Spirit just checked me. So you're going to go talk to who about what? What's coming out of your mouth? And it was almost like this was the blessing of this, guys. This isn't about making you feel bad. This isn't about making you feel guilty. Oh, I feel bad I did that. I said that. No, this is, this is the greatest way to know at any given time. It was wonderful of the Lord to do that for me. It was like, thank you, Lord. I'm not filled with your spirit. I thought I was. I mean, I studied for a study. I'm ready to go teach it. I must be filled, but I wasn't. So I stopped myself. Lord, thank you. Thank you. I thank you for this lady. I, I gave, I, by the time I got up equal with her, I was actually smiling and not, not unfrustrated, didn't, didn't matter anymore. And I was like, what a blessing that lady performed for me today. Got my attention to realize that I'm going to go speak on being filled with the Spirit, and I'm not. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I was so happy. The rest of the way up, Nothing hit me, man. No slow drivers, no lights, nothing, no impediments. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because my words were an indication. Unkind things coming out of my mouth toward my wife, I'm not filled with the Spirit. Man, the enemy's got a hold of me there. You know, sarcastic things really meant to hurt somebody, 
Now listen, don't get me wrong. I love sarcasm. Sarcasm makes the world go round. I live on sarcasm. But there's unkind sarcasm. There's fun sarcasm, then there's unkind sarcasm. You know, I, it, it's amazing how gullible people can get sometimes about things. Did, did you know, by the way, do you know the word gullible is not even in the English dictionary? Okay, I'm going to let you think about that for a second. <laughs> All right, so yeah, go for the snare drum on that one. My point is this. Words will be a great indicator. What's coming out of your mouth, it's what's, it's what's in your heart, and it'll help you. Now, the second way I can tell is he says in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we touched on that before with, you know, uh, you know prison to praise and some other things that Carruthers wrote and, you know, the, 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 the message that was his. See, now, the, the thing that is, there's a great principle there, but I don't like it when people turn things into a magic wand. That's what some of these writers do. They take a principle that we should all know and trust and turn it into a magic wand. It is definitely a principle for me to watch my attitude, not just my words, but my attitude. And um, that all comes back to this. I'm either thankful or I'm not. And when I'm complaining about something, that's a good indication my attitude's not in the right thing place. I'm not seeing God's hand in this thing. So I have to watch that as another indication. Wow, my attitude is so bad right now. Lord, thank you for showing me. This is me. This isn't you. Forgive me. Fill me with your spirit again. It becomes a ding. Get filled. You're empty. See, because the problem isn't getting filled, guys. It's the easiest thing in the world. The problem is we leak in a lot of ways. And we don't even know we've leaked. This helps us tell us, I've leaked. Look at my words. Look at my attitude. Giving, by the way, this is a, this is a little deeper than you might think. It's, this isn't just about being thankful Notice what he says, giving thanks always for all things. Now, you do the math on that. You figure out that for yourself. Thanking God always for all things? What? I can think of some things that I have a real hard stretch to think, how should I be thankful about that? But boy, nothing is wasted with God. We may not see it now. We may not see it in the next, you know, you know, a few years, it might be a decade before some things are unfolded. Are you willing to wait and trust? And, okay, Lord, thank you. I don't understand what's going on here. I don't know why you allowed that. I could tell you a, a lot of illustrations on this one. I mean, one of the great ones for me was I was a young pastor and living on a very meager budget and literally, you know, barely making it. But we prayed. We trusted the Lord. And one day, you know, we just went to the grocery store. We got a refrigerator all filled and next morning we noticed the refrigerator was broken and all that food in the refrigerator was starting to go and I was so mad at God God I've, I mean I could be making a lot of money out there and I'm serving you and I'm sacrificing and this is the thanks I get you know I'm like I had a bad attitude and um you know, we scraped the money together. We got the refrigerator fixed. We get a little more food in there. And two weeks later, it broke again. And I'm not that smart, but I'm smart enough to figure out. I didn't learn the lesson the first time. The Lord's going for round two. Okay, Lord, I got the message. And I just began to thank him. Lord, this is out of my hands now. I totally know you're in this. I know you've got a purpose in this. You've got a plan. You're teaching me something, and I just want to say thank you. I'm sorry that I didn't learn the lesson the first time. Within an hour, I get a call from a lady who we promised she could store her things in our garage, and a truck came up. In the truck was a refrigerator. So I called her and said, listen, would you mind ours are just broke if I could just use yours until we get ours fixed? And she goes, you know, it's an old refrigerator. It works great, and it's going to be a long time. Why don't you just keep it? The Lord gave me a refrigerator within an hour. <laughs> and it was such a faith booster. It was like, okay, Lord, I see this. I get this. You are in control. Everything that's happening, you're using for a purpose, and I've got to trust you in it. The hardest ones are when it's loved ones, when it's your family, it's when, when health things, you know, with the people that you love. Those are the tough ones, but even then, what, are, what good are you going to do if you're not filled with the Spirit, if you're not trusting the Lord has this covered even, even though you can't see it? 
And then, of course, the third one is probably one of the most challenging ones, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Why that's a challenge is because of this. We've got to look at people differently. We have our little pecking order, don't we? And I, I hate those human pecking orders that we get into. You know, who's, you go to a pastor's conference and people say, how many people are in your church? I hate that question. I usually say, more than I deserve. Or we, we just got a lovely fellowship, sweet people. I never use numbers because I, I think it just, it puts this again, everyone's sizing you up. This is what the world does. They're going to size you up and see where you fit in their pecking order. And so they ask you questions about yourself. You get to learn your education, how you talk, how you look, all the things that people measure you by, your, how attractive you are or handsome, how much money you have, how charismatic you are, and you're sized up, and you get standing. But here's the thing. Jesus had the highest standing of all, and he went down to the lowest of the lows. And if you had two kings who each owned half of the world, and one king sat up on his throne, all the fruits of his labors are being raised up to him into the pedestal, and he's eating the best, living the best. He never goes down to see people. The other guy over there gets dressed in rags each day, goes down and sees how people are living. Who's the greatest? We know who's the greatest, the one who comes down. The Lord came down. We're called to be like him. We're, we're called to honor those who the world doesn't honor. And you know, even people that are the worst sinners and the greatest haters of Christianity deserve our respect as people made in God's image. And there's something powerful about that. But also just submitting to one another in the church is not worrying about yourself. Thinking of who you can build up. So all of this comes down to, I, I really believe this, this theme of hope really should resonate with us. And this is the, this is the driving force. I'm going to close with one verse that I'm actually teaching on because we're right here in Colossians, and it's amazing how this dovetailed in. It's verse 5 of Colossians 1. Well, let's, let's tie verse 3 to 4 in because it all makes sense. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since... We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, okay? That's what you're going to be known for. You trust him. And of your love for all the saints, which is how faith best works. You now care for people. But then he says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as it is to all the world, bringing forth fruit, and is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of, truth and, uh, grace of God and truth. It's interesting that hope seems to be the spring from which feeds your faith and your love. Power of hope. Don't underestimate it. You can endure so much, and everything you are enduring, if your mind is not all about living here for this pleasure, gratifying myself now in this lifetime, if I think, no, it's much more than that, it's beyond this lifetime. It's who among my circle of influence might just be the next Billy Graham or D.L. Moody. And I might just be the shoe, spur, shoe salesman that just hears God's voice to reach out to them. So men, be those men. Be men of hope as an anchor to find who you are through what God has said about you. Thank you, Lord, for these guys. I thank you for them taking this time in their Saturday and especially this time of year when there's so many projects around the house to be done. I pray, Lord, that they'd go back home and with invigorated, encouraged, uh, ready to lead their families to church the weekend, ready to find out how they can serve their spouses for those who are married or if they're single, how they can just continue to develop those, that godly character in you. Thank you for these men. Bless and guide and lead. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen.